Are you guys good? Guns are quiet. So let's start with your upbringing. Tell me about your, your hometown. Well, I grew up in Wausau, Wisconsin, which is a small town in the middle of Wisconsin. It's about 35,000 people. With the surrounding areas, about 100,000. Uh, and it was great. It actually, my mother likes to say that I had a childhood that was five minutes away because we had a world-class ballet teacher and ballet studio, five minutes from our house, piano lessons, ice skating, you know, brownies and Girl Scouts, you know, every possible kind of lesson, and it was all really close by. And did you, um, w tell me about your parents as well. What did your father do? Uh, my father is an engineer, uh, and so he works on water. And, and cleaning water, and, uh, and my mother was an art teacher, and then she stayed home with us. And so you have siblings? I have a younger brother, his name is Mason. Did your parents have what you'd think now of as traditional roles in the household? I guess they had traditional roles in the household. I mean, my father did the yard work, and uh, my mother did a lot of the, the indoor, indoor work. They actually shared, uh, shared responsibilities on cooking. And so, you know, they, I think that they had some, they were somewhat of a modern couple. So was there a sense that expectations for you were different from, from your brother? You know, not really that I noticed. So I didn't really notice any difference in expectations between me and my brother. I think that, you know, I was always very good at math and science. And I guess I never really knew that that was strange. And who did you look up to of your, of your parents most? Uh, I, well, I'm, I think that I've got, a, I've got a great relationship with both my parents. So my mother is my best friend. Uh, and my father and I, we just think alike. And so we really, you know, when it comes time to make a difficult decision or talk something through, you know, he and I will reason about a problem the same way. When you were growing up, I'm thinking of high school years, were there any expectations about, you know, would you have a career or would that be marriage? Sure. I think that... Uh, I was always very good at math and science. It was very clear that I was going to go to college. I wanted to be a doctor, and my parents were very, very supportive of that. Uh, I actually didn't think that I would get married. Uh, and, you know, I, w I was willing to get married if the right person came along, but I really didn't think that that would happen. Uh, and, you know, I, I knew that I really wanted to, to have a career and really do something, particularly in the fields of math or science. What about high school? Were you big into sports? I mean, what was sort of, what got you going in high school? What was exciting about that? Um, well, in high school, I did almost everything. <laughs> so uh, I went to a high school that actually had a modular scheduling system, which means instead of having eight periods a day, like a lot of, a lot of schools, uh, there were 21 20-minute mods, making up a seven-hour day. And it actually allowed for a scheduling that was a lot more like college, because you might have your chem lab um, mods 10 through 12 on Tuesdays and Thursdays, meaning that was an hour-long block. But your English section might be Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, just mods 5 and 6 for 40 minutes. And so that flexible scheduling left a lot of, left a lot of independence and also left all kinds of opportunities to pack, your, to pack your schedule. So I remember being the first person at my high school to take all five offered AP courses. I remember my junior year ma managing to take 10 classes. I had a very good friend who was at the more traditional high school across uh, town. There's Wausau East, which is more traditional, and Wausau West, where I went, which was on the modular system. And even giving up lunch and study hall, she could only take eight classes. And I actually managed a way to, to figure out how to take 10. But I also did a lot of extracurriculars. Uh, so I was um, on the, the pom-pom team, which is the Midwestern version of a dance squad. And uh, I also did debate, Spanish club, key club, uh, all kinds of volunteer work. I think all in, I probably had about 10 different extracurriculars. And what did your parents, were your parents ferrying you around, like here and there to make uh, everything happen? My, my mother, my, bro my brother and I were both very busy, and so my mother played, played a good part of her time as, uh, as chauffeur. <laughs> Coming out of high school, you're thinking college, you're thinking pre-med. That's the path you're on at sure. that moment. Sure. Well, one of, my, one of my vices is that I like to overwhelm myself with options. And coming from a small town in Wisconsin, we really didn't know what kinds of colleges I would get into. So I applied to 10 schools. Uh, and so I applied to major research universities like Harvard, Stanford, Duke, Yale. I applied to University of Wisconsin-Madison. That's the, the great school you know, in my home state. I applied to a lot of small liberal arts colleges. Uh, in the Midwest, you know, Carleton, McAllister, uh, all kinds of, of schools in that category. And I also applied to Johns Hopkins because it's great for medicine, to Northwestern uh, in, 
uh, in Illinois, and and I got in everywhere, uh, and so that which was was really lucky, and I was really happy about that. But it left me with a lot of hard choices, and so as I thought about college and what I wanted from it, uh, I re it really for me came down to Stanford and Duke. And then I realized that, well, Duke is a wonderful school. A lot of what they wanted me to do there was dance team, was debate, was you know the the college version of, of Key Club, which is Circle K. And I realized that I didn't really want my college experience to be just like my high school experience. I wanted something more academic and more intellectual. And you know, and I was really inspired by a lot of what was happening out here at Stanford. I had come to visit the the campus, and I loved it. And so ultimately, I, I picked Stanford. Growing up, had you traveled a lot? I traveled a lot in the Midwest, uh, and somewhat, I shouldn't say that, not only in the Midwest, but all of through the country, but I had not, I actually didn't leave the country until I was 22. So basically, my parents, I think, in an effort to make sure that we were really well-rounded, it means that we spent most of our weekends either in Milwaukee, Chicago, or Minneapolis, going to art openings, going to the theater. So, you know, my mother, being an art teacher, it was very important to her that we really understand culture. Uh, and we'd also done a lot of travel in the U.S. So we'd been to, to Florida, we had been to Arizona. I had taken one trip with my uh, church youth group down to Dallas. We had done a driving tour out to Yellowstone. And so we, you know, I'd seen a, a good part of the country, but I actually hadn't left the, the country until I was 22. Was that unusual? I mean, it strikes me that for, you know, for a small town in, in the Midwest, you just had this, you know, large vision already at a very young age. Well, I think that my, for my parents, it was very important uh, for them that we have a good worldly view. I remember that actually when I was picking my schools, my mother went to, to see her doctor who had gone, I forget which school he had gone to, but he even had gone to a school in the Midwest and he said, look, the schools in the Midwest are wonderful, but she grew up in the Midwest. And if you really want her to have vision like this as opposed to vision like that and really have seen more of it, he's like, you know, send her somewhere outside of the Midwest and, uh, and really try and get her exposed and get her exposed to more. And so you know, it was interesting. I think that that was something that really sh shifted my mother's viewpoint. She had always worked to make sure that we were very worldly and cultured, but this, this notion that if I had only experienced the Midwest all the way through college, uh, as much as I love the Midwest, that you know, somehow my view would be narrower. I think that that's something that really made her more comfortable with the idea of sending me far away for school. So you choose Stanford, you get there. What are your first impressions? Well, I think that actually, before I move on to that, let me just say that one of the reasons I, t I opted against Johns Hopkins and against Northwestern, Northwestern had actually expect had accepted me into a special program where you went for undergraduate and then straight into med school. You were already accepted into med school as you were a freshman in college. But I realized that I might not want to be a doctor. There was something I thought, I was very certain that I thought I might be, but there was something in me that I think thought, you know, what if you get there and you decide you might want to do something else? And if you're in, on this program or at a school that's really, really excellent in medicine, you know, will you have the opportunity to change into something else? And so uh, that was something that, that weighed on me. I came to Stanford. Uh, I took the chemistry courses and started taking, you know, the, bio the different biology courses. And, uh, and I liked it, and I was very good at it. But it was a lot of memorization. And so when I went home after my freshman year and compared notes with a lot of my friends who were also interested in medicine, I realized that while I was going far away and to a much more expensive school, I was basically taking the same classes. And so, you know, we were all memorizing the same flashcards, we were all memorizing the same equations. And I really thought about, well, you know, how can I get the most out of my Stanford experience? And one of the ways to get the most out of it is to do something you can only do at Stanford. So I started looking at what is Stanford good at. It's very good at psychology. It's very good at computer science. Uh, and I found this interesting interdisciplinary major uh, called Symbolic Systems, which combines philosophy, psychology, linguistics, and computer science. And so that was one of the things that, that led me into computer science and got me, really, got me really interested. What was the buzz about that course? Well, I think that one of the, there were a couple of different things that happened along the way. So the end of, tail end of my freshman year, I took a, an introductory CS course, computer science course, 
uh, ca specifically called computer science for non-majors. <laughs> and so, and I remember that the professor, Stephen Clossing, started the course by saying, you know, there were about 400 of us there because it was a requirement you had to fill, in, you know, for graduation. And, uh, and he said, you know, studies and extensive data have shown that exactly two of you will go on to take any additional computer science at all. So we're going to make this really, really easy for you. And we did a little bit of programming. That was actually, interestingly, when the Mosaic browser and Netscape were just getting started, because this was the spring of 1994. And so we used those in that course. Uh, and what I really loved about it was that it was a different problem every day. You got to think about something in a new and interesting way. There was no formula. There was no recipe. There was no memorization. And growing up, I had gone to a science camp along the way, the National Youth Science Camp in West Virginia, where they send two delegates from each state. And it's an amazing place. They get wonderful speakers, professors from different esteemed universities. The counselors are often Rhodes Scholars. And there was this one lecturer named uh, Zun Nguyen, who I was really taken with, as were all the other people in the camp. He was just very engaging, super smart, and he could talk about almost everything and sound intelligent. He would give us different riddles, like, you know, if I walk like this, you know, where, where you know, which muscle in my body is injured? And so, you know, we'd all spend the whole day walking around the camp like that, trying to figure out what muscle we weren't using. And uh, he was just, he was just a very inspiring person. And we, I remember one day we were all talking about how smart Zune was. And it's wonderful that his name is Zune because it actually makes the whole thing sound like a Chinese proverb. Mm -hmm. But we were, we were going on and on about how smart Zune was. And then one of the counselors, I think a little annoyed and probably a little envious of, of our Zune worship, suddenly said, you know, you guys, you have it all wrong. It's not what Zune knows, it's how Zune thinks. And you could drop him into an unfamiliar situation, and within five minutes, he'd be asking the right questions and drawing the right conclusions. And it's not just what he knows, it's actually how he thinks. And while I was sitting there in my freshman organic chemistry courses and getting started on the biology core at Stanford with all of my flashcards, I just had this constant refrain in my mind, it's not what Zune knows, it's how Zune thinks. So fast forward to that computer science course, spring of my freshman year, a different problem every day. It wasn't, you know, so much what we were memorizing, it was what we were learning and how we were think learning to think about particular problems. So when I found symbolic systems, it was really exciting to me because I could take that computer science, that that new way of of how, thinking about how, new problems and actually apply it because symbolic systems is cognitive psychology, how do people learn? Philosophy, how do people reason? linguistics, how do people express themselves, and computer science, can you train a computer to do the same? And so for me, I realized I had always been very interested in neuroscience, and I wanted to be a pediatric, pediatric neurosurgeon as I was growing up. Uh, but I realized that I was less interested in cutting up the brain, and I was much more interested in how the brain worked. And so I really felt that, you know, what better way to look at that and what better way to really think about how do people reason, how do they learn about new problems and new scenarios other than to actually study, you know, the, the, you know, study how do people learn, how do they reason, how do they express themselves and really get to apply that. And can you tell me the story about your first computer as well? I was a prolific babysitter as I, as I was growing up, and so I had saved up about $2,000 by the time I got to school. And that money immediately went to a computer. So I went over to the Stanford bookstore and bought a Centris 610, uh, which was just, you know, it was a great, a great computer at, the, at that time, and uh, got it back to my dorm room. And I remember not knowing how to turn it on. And so I had to have Harry, Harry uh, Lai, our, our resident computer consultant, come up, show me how to turn it on, show me how to use the mouse. Uh, it was really something that just was super foreign at the time, really interesting to me, but very foreign. And that was the fall of my freshman year. And it actually, it came full circle because by uh, the end of my senior year, I was a head TA of one of the courses. At Stanford, there's three introductory computer science courses, CS106A, 106B, and 106X. And uh, I was the head TA for CS106A. And Harry was the TA for CS106X. And I still remember when we stood up in front of all the section leaders to greet our staffs for the, for the uh, 
for the classes, Harry sort of looked at me and said, "How did you? How did you catch up to me? I remember, you know, you showing me, you know, me showing you how to use the mouse and and you know and how to turn on your computer." But I think the amazing thing about computer science is it is a field where you can make big gains quickly, and it's a fast-moving young science, and it's easy to catch up, especially if you're inspired. Remember your first time you saw the internet? The first time I saw the internet was spring of my freshman year in the in computer science 105a the uh, introductory to computer science for non-majors uh, we had one assignment that wasn't programming but instead was using the mosaic browser to browse to different sites and i guess at the time it seemed so disconnected like in fact i think at that point i remember using or stumbling upon what would become yahoo but it was literally just a file that was called like Jerry's list of links. Uh, and I, th I think that's what ultimately what became Yahoo. And I remember stumbling upon it then. But at that time, the internet was so disconnected. Literally, the assignment would tell you exactly what URL to type in the browser. And it would bring it up. And so you know, our assignment was you know, type in this URL, you know, find out the you know, the price of country fried steak at like a local Palo Alto restaurant, because there was like one restaurant that had their menu online. So it wasn't as immersive an experience as the internet is today. It was just sort of a, you know, a jumble of pages. It was hard to find your way. The pages weren't really connected to each other. And, you know, I remember navigating it basically using the, the Mosaic browser, but not really getting a sense of the, of the whole picture of, of what was to come at that point. Do you think it would amount to anything? I definitely thought that it was something that was very interesting. As we, as we learned about it, you know, it was very clear that this was something that you know DARPA had been doing for years. It was a large and interconnected system throughout the whole world. Interestingly, I thought it would have more to do with communication, email, and routing all of that, and less to do with storing information and publishing information online as it, you know, I mean, now it really is all three. But at the time, it was easy to imagine the communication uses. It was harder to imagine the publishing usage and the, and the storage usage. So you're going through college. How many women are there when you shift mm -hmm. majors? Well, I think that one of the unusual things about my experience is, you know, all throughout, I was always a geek. I was good at math and science. And if you're a geek, you know, that just kind of neutralizes the issue of gender. But I also think that no one ever called out to me that it was strange to be a girl who was good at math and science. In high school, no one ever pointed that out. In college, I guess I was just kind of gender oblivious. Because I remember distinctly there was this one columnist in at the Stanford Daily that I just loved. And I really looked forward to her column every Wednesday. And there was this one Wednesday, uh, I forget her last name, but her first name was Julie, when I was looking at Julie's column. And she wrote a piece on campus icons, where she defined an icon as you know sort of memorable people around the campus where you often know them, but you know them more by description than even by name. Right? There's the crazy guy in White Plaza that yells at everyone when you bike past. There's, you know, she was like, you know, the, the librarian with the, the glasses and the chain over at, you know, uh, over at Green Library. And so she had a list of different campus icons. And it was sort of fun to read through them and sort of chuckle to yourself as to, you know, oh, I know this one, I know that one, I know exactly who she's talking about here. And then all of a sudden there was a bullet point in the list that said the blonde woman in the upper division computer science courses. And I remember thinking like, well, I should, I should know that one. Who, who is that? <laughs> right? and, and then I realized it was me. Right? Because, and I, just, it, I, I never noticed up until that point that I was strange or stood out in any way due to, to gender or my coloring or anything like that. And so I think that I was lucky. It really wasn't until I was a professional woman that people said, you know, look, we really need to do a lot more for girls in math and science, and there's not enough of them. I, you know, I really wasn't that aware that I was an anomaly until much later. You've switched away from medicine, which is a very clear path, into something that's more about exploration, more about curiosity, more about a way of seeing the world. Was there a career apparent along that path yet? Or? 
No, I think that it was very it was very hard actually for my parents to get a sense of okay, well she was going to be a pediatric neurosurgeon and she was taking all these classes in chemistry and biology and suddenly she's talking about something called symbolic systems and we don't know what that is and there's no clear there's no clear career path there. But I basically said, you know, I really want to I really want to expand my mind this way, work on these kinds of problems. I can always specialize later in graduate school, and I did end up going on to do that. I did a master's in pure computer science at the end of this, but I really felt that getting a nice, broad liberal arts uh, education was something that was, it's a really unique opportunity, and you can only do it once, and you can always specialize later. And so, you know, I felt that this was something that I was really interested in, and Tom Wasau, the director of the Symbolic Systems Program, sold me on it. Uh, by saying, interestingly, I knew that he would try and sell me on the program when I went to talk to him about whether or not I should, should end up majoring in symbolic systems, but the way he sold me on it was very interesting. He didn't, you know, I thought for sure he would talk about his teaching and the courses, and I went in and I said, well, I'm thinking about becoming a symbolic systems major, and he said, oh, you absolutely should. All the most interesting Stanford students are. <laughs> I thought that was really interesting because he didn't try and sell me necessarily on the classes, on his teaching, on the curriculum. All of that was very good, but he really felt that it was important to be surrounded by interesting and thought-provoking people. And I think it, you know, that was something that really influenced me. And how did you first hear about Google? So I spent the summer of 1998 uh, in Switzerland, working for the Union Bank of Switzerland in their research lab. And it was a great experience. There were researchers from all over the world and interns from all over the world. I think we had 20 different countries represented in a group of 30 people total. And it was just a really exciting and wonderful time. And what, what I was working on that summer was basically creating a web recommendation system. So if you, for example, visit sites A, B, and C, later, if someone visits site B, could you recommend sites A and C because they're adjacent in someone else's path through the web, probably they're related to each other or relevant. And the Union Bank of Switzerland was interested in this because they thought it would make their traders more efficient in the morning. Because if everyone comes in and starts looking at the price of gold or the price of oil, it would help people hone in faster if they had this recommender tool running along the side. So I had spent the summer working on that, tuning constants, really getting a tool up and running on that. And when I came back, I met with Eric Roberts, who was my longtime mentor at Stanford, and who had hired me to teach for the first time. So I had been a TA, and I had been a section leader, but I had never been a lecturer. And so I was lecturing my first computer science course. Uh, and I sat down, I met with him to get, you know, to get up to speed on teaching a course, the mechanics of it, uh, and get any advice that he had. And then he also wanted to know about my summer, my summer project. And I told him about it and he said, oh, that's so interesting. There's these guys on the fourth floor that are doing what you're doing. They're not looking at where people go on the web, however, but they're actually looking at the link structure of the web. Where do pages link and can you tell relevance and relatedness based on that? And they just dropped out to start a company uh, it's, he's like, it's Larry Page and Sergey Brin. He's like, I don't remember the name of the company that they started. And I said, well, you know, Eric, no matter. I just moved back into the country. I'm teaching for the first time. I'm pretty overwhelmed. I don't have time to, uh, to, to go and meet up with a startup and do work on a startup right now. So no matter. Um, and then it wasn't until eight or nine months later when I got an email asking me to come and interview at Google that I realized when I was reading that email, I was like, wait. like. I know this company, someone's talked to me about this before, and then I realized this was the company that Eric had talked to me about the previous September. Uh, and I still give him a very hard time that he couldn't remember the name Google. <laughs> and your first interview, when you go and meet the guys? My first interview at Google was with Larry and Sergey, And we sat at a ping pong table that doubled both as a recreation for the office as well as a conference table. Uh, and we, I remember Sergey is very mathematical and he spent a lot of time really grilling me on artificial intelligence concepts because my specialization was, uh, was artificial intelligence. And so we spent a lot of time talking about k-means clustering and all kinds of different ways you can train neural networks. And so I spent a lot of time uh, talking through all the equations and what if you have this data set, what if you have that data set with, with Sergey. And Larry seemed really distracted. Uh, throughout. It was clear his mind was somewhere else. Uh, come to find out, as soon as they got up from the interview and they walked out, I heard most people in the office get up and leave, and they were headed to go and pitch one of the venture capital firms 
uh, and I believe they were going to Kleiner Perkins, who we ultimately got some of our some of our funding from. And so they got up and left. And so I think he was getting ready for his pitch and really thinking about that. But it was really funny because the office manager Heather walked in and she said, you know, I know that it was very important to you that we really get all of your interviews done today. But the entire company, except for me, has just left to go to the venture capitalist office. So I think you're going to have to come back tomorrow. <laughs> and what is Google? The easiest way to think about Google is to think about it at its root, which is, at its root, it really is a search engine, and that's where we started. But one of the things we recognized is with the explosion of information online and with the usefulness of search as a paradigm, it became so much more. It turns out that being able to store a lot of information and being able to search a lot of information is useful for email. It's useful for books. It's also useful for things like driverless cars. You know, you have lots of different information coming in through different sensors, figuring out which signal you should pay attention to and how you should make a decision. Should you change lane? Should you go straight? Should you swerve? All of those things are search problems. And they're all, they all have, as part of their characteristic, a lot of data and the fact that search is a tool that can really help you when you have a lot of data. And did you think it would get this big? I think that I definitely saw some indications of success. I don't think I really saw this particular magnitude in, uh, in terms of an overall outcome. I think that you know when I was graduating from college, I liked to, again, surround myself with too many options. So it was the height of the internet bubble. It was 1999. Being a master's in computer science, graduating from Stanford was a great place to be. I had 14 job offers. Uh, and I looked at all of them, and they were some of them were to continue teaching at places like Carnegie Mellon. Some of them were big software companies like Oracle, management consulting firms, and then there were the startups. And when I looked at the startups, and it's interesting because I still have some of the ma different matrices I drew. But as I was looking at my options, you know, I would look at things like location, salary. I sort of had a happiness index. Looking at all of of these different factors, and one of the factors was percentage chance of success overall the enterprise, which really came into play for the startups. And well, a lot of the startups, I gave a chance, you know, a 0.02 percent chance of succeeding. I actually gave Google about a two percent chance of succeeding. So it was about a hundred times better than any of the other startups that I had met. But I still thought, you know, 50 odds were 50 to one that we would fail. But what really drew me to Google was I realized that I would learn more here, being part of the process of building a company, being part of the process of making something, than I would anywhere else failing. And so you know, for me, I was like, OK, let's take the job where I'm going to learn a lot. And maybe I'll learn a lot and we'll succeed. And maybe I'll learn a lot and we'll fail. But I'm just ultimately going to learn more being inside a company learning how the decisions get made, being in the room when the decisions get made, uh, than I will if I'm not. Many of the women that we talked to have said, very hard to generalize, but maybe one of the characteristics of a lot of women that they've noticed is the sort of not wanting to lean forward, not wanting to push forward, and maybe not being comfortable with the prospect of speaking out too much and maybe, maybe failing. Has that ever struck you? I think part of me finds failure kind of exhilarating. Uh, I th and I think that, when I remember back to when I was choosing my jobs, as I, as I said, I was choosing between about 14 different offers. And they were across all kinds of different sectors, teaching, management consulting, large software firms, small startups. And I could pick the best job in each sector, but it was hard for me to decide across the different sectors. And I remember sitting down during spring break, before I even had the Google offer, and I remember thinking, like, you're going to need to figure out some criteria of how you're going to make this decision. And I said, well, why don't you think about the best decisions you've ever made and see if they have anything in common? So I made a list of the best decisions I had ever made. One was going to Stanford. One was choosing to major in symbolic systems. One was getting to work at Stanford Research uh, Institute up in Menlo Park uh, with all the legends of artificial intelligence for a summer. And the, uh, another was getting to move to Switzerland for the summer uh, to work with the Union Bank of Switzerland's research uh, arm. And I realized that they all had, even though they were really different, right? One's where do you go to school, one's where do you work in the summer, one's, you know, what do you major and what's your discipline? They were all really different, but they all had two things in common. One, I always chose to work with the smartest 
and most interesting people I could find. And two, I always did something I was a little not ready to do. What's your proudest achievement here, looking back at that time? I think it's hard for me to pinpoint just one thing at Google. You know, throughout the time, my time here, I started off as an engineer for the first two and a half years, actually writing the code, which is the Google web server uh, that answers your query. So when you talk to Google, the, the thing that produces those web pages that answer you and write the search results page, those were things that I actually coded on. Uh, and so, you know, between that and now having worked on somewhere between 75 to 100 different features or products that, you know, have come subsequently in the past 12 years, I think that my proudest achievement really is Google itself. I think that the company we've built, the culture that we've built, and the really positive impact that I like to think that we've had on the world in terms of helping people find more information and making their lives easier, more convenient, more well-informed, you know, that's really ultimately what I'm most proud of. Why has it been such a struggle to have women involved in this field? First, I'd like to say that I think that one of the things that, that computer science and the technical fields have on their side is that they're young and new sciences and disciplines. And it is a fast-moving place where it's easy to play catch-up. That said, I do think that for a lot of girls, they may not spend a lot of their teenage years playing video games. And the applications of how would I use computer science may not be as obvious. I'm hopeful that now with Google and Facebook and Twitter and some of these things and Zynga, some of these things that, cha that touch their lives every day, that, that will prompt more women to come into computer science. But that said, they often, you know, women I talk to will feel that, well, you know, people have been programming, you know, these guys have been programming since they were 10 and they've been playing extensive video games since they were 13. Like, I won't catch up. But the nice thing about computer science is that you can catch up. Uh, and it is possible to pick things up. And it is a new and fast moving field. And I think that's something that's really exciting. And I also think that when you're passionate about something, it's a gender neutralizing force. For me, I'm not a woman at Google. I'm a geek at Google. And this is a wonderful place to be a geek. Right? For me, I'm excited. I've got my list of different apps I want to try, different gadgets I want to try, different websites I've heard about, and swapping stories here. You know, have you tried that? What did you think of this? Was it fast enough? Did it work well enough? Did it seem like the recommendations were good enough? How was the relevance? Right? You know, all of these different, you know, things that we all love to try, you know, that's really how I connect with my coworkers. And so, you know, for me it's much more being here amidst the geeks and much less about the issues of gender. In a startup that's just grown at an astronomical rate, how do you keep boundaries? How do you keep a balance in your life? I mean, for me, work is fun and fun is work. Uh, so, you know, I work a lot. I work really hard. I still do get a chance to have some fun. I love to travel. I like, in the winter, I like to ski and, you know, and I like, I still like to shop, even though I shop more online these days and have things shipped to the office. But I do, you know, I do think that, you know, I still am able to do some cultural things and, and some things that are fun outside of work. But interestingly, you know, more often than not, those things, for me, have connections back to work. Right on the cultural side and on the art side, that's something my mother had always really taught me to appreciate. Now I'm really involved with Google Doodles, uh, you know, the fun logos that appear on our homepage. They're certainly not the technical side of my job, but there's something that's really fun to get to think about the art we could put there and how we could expose people to new ideas and the artists we could work with. I think that you know it's fun for me to see how some of my extracurricular interests actually become some of my mainstream part of work. Uh, interests and so you know, I don't worry about balance. I, th I worry more about being inspired and being passionate about what I'm working on. Do you think situation for women has changed? Well, I certainly think that the situation for women in technology has changed. I think that when you look today at how many different services there are that touch everyone's daily lives, when I was growing up, I knew one computer scientist. She worked at J.C. Penney on, on the catalog system, and it was hard for me to envision. What does her everyday look like? What is she building? What is she making? Today, you know, if you're a lover of video games, you see those, but also you see all the technologies, smartphones, the internet, you know, so it's everything from Google to Facebook to all the different apps you could use on your phone. I think all of those are exciting ways where these services can touch a person's lives. And when you look at how far that's come, from when I was a child until now, there's just huge growth and huge opportunity. And the fact that the technology is now so tangible in our everyday lives, I think will inspire a lot more women to go into technology. Into technology and I'm really heartened by that. I think that it's amazing to me because I remember watching the Jetsons when I was five and thinking, 
awesome. When I'm 30, there'll be flying cars. <laughs> and I think what's interesting is that the, the transportation industry has you know, not really evolved and innovated much at all. And now we're trying for driverless cars. We're nowhere close to a flying car. They, they haven't even produced a prototype that's, that's safe and sound. But I do think that the, the revolution that no one was expecting was that of the internet and of information technology. And I think that when you look at what's happened there and how different our world looks today than when I was five, I remember you know, I was always a curious kid. And I remember you know, having to go to the library to research the most mundane details. I remember one time we had a large group of kids that lived on my street growing up and we would play games in the backyard and we were trying, we were very, you know, we were all very precise, we were all really smart and we, and we wanted to set up a perfect professional size baseball diamond. And we got into a large argument about was it 88 feet between the bases or was it 90 feet between the bases and we couldn't resolve it and the group split half thought that it was 88 half thought it was 90 and there was no way to resolve it because no one wanted to say let's go and get our parents to drive us to the library to look up how many feet are between the bases of a baseball diamond and today if you think about that it's you know 30 seconds of someone running in the house typing it in to google and finding the answer and i think that you know, it's really amazing to think about how far, in particular, that one dimension we've come. What's the most meaningful, the most useful piece of advice you've ever had? Well, I'll talk about the piece of advice that I like the most. I like to ask people what's the best piece of advice they've ever gotten. And um, one of those is, wait five more minutes. <laughs> and I think wait for five more minutes works in the proverbial sense. You know, something isn't going right in your career, it's not going right in your project, wait five more minutes because the truth is you're in it and you can reason about it better than almost anyone can and things will often, will often turn around. If you're waiting for the bus, wait five more minutes, probably a bus will come. Uh, I think another piece of advice that I, I really, I've heard that I really, I really loved is that if you don't have any shadows, you're not standing in the light. And I think that that's just a really wonderful observation and you know, hopefully, especially with, with women, coaches them to, to, to lean in.